welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Faith and Victory. I was sharing out the uh, the link to Facebook real quick um, so that everybody out there in the cyber world can join in with us tonight. So happy to have you. Um, Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're teaching on faith foundations. And um, tonight we want to uh, talk about seven steps or seven um, points uh, to the highest kind of faith. Hallelujah. Now, uh, in order for someone to develop a successful faith walk, you must gain insight into certain aspects of your walk with God. Um, God's merciful. And so we understand that the growth is a process. Developing is a process. Developing in faith is a process. God deals to us the measure of faith, that our faith is exceeding growing faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So um, if you don't have, you know, all seven in full function operational status right off the get-go, it doesn't mean you're not going to be able to do, get anything or, or with, from God or be able to please God or be able to honor God. Um, but we, want, we, do, we do strive to grow and to develop and mature um, in faith. And so um, make sure we understand when, I, when we say these things, you go, oh, gosh, I don't have three and four, and that, that's, it doesn't disqualify you. That's what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> um, but in order to develop into a mature faith and uh, steadfast and long-term walking by faith, you do need to develop uh, in these areas of, of either understanding or action. Okay, um, so keep in mind that we do overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Hallelujah. So don't, you know, it's not, it's not all in you alone on this one area or it's your toast. It's, it's, uh, it's a co-op between you and God. Hallelujah. Let's look at uh, the first thing we need to uh, understand and have a revelation of or uh, realization of in our life uh, in order to get to the highest kind of faith. And that is a understanding of the integrity of God's word. Understanding of the integrity of God's word. God's word is exactly what it declares itself to be. God's word. And that's a, that's a heavy revy. Um, and that one's an over the top revy. But go with me, if we will, to Psalm 119. The 119th Psalm. And we'll look at verse 89. Hallelujah. And it says here, Forever. O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Praise God. Um, now that does tell us that it's eternal. It doesn't change. It's not transient. It's not God, it's flippant. You know, one minute he's here, the next minute he's over there. Um, I am the Lord and I change not. Uh, it does. It doesn't mean that one minute he'll. He says, "I'm I'm the Jehovah um, Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee." He turns right around the next minute and goes, "I'm Jehovah the sickness giver." You know, I'm the one that maketh thee sick. Um, <clears throat> or, um, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless His holy name and forget not all of His benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities? Who healeth all thy diseases? And then tomorrow it's. I don't forgive you and I don't heal you. Tough. Uh, God's not that way. God's word is settled. God's word is, let's say it this way. When we talk in terms of legality uh, in our own country, in our constitution, um, and we begin to refer to things um, in legal legalese, uh, when you're taking court cases and that kind of stuff, and there's a court case about maybe this or maybe that. One of the things you'll hear a lot of times is that's settled law. 
That's settled law. In other words, that's already been established. There's no, you just don't change that. Okay, it's settled. God's word is forever settled in heaven. So it's settled law. It is a law, you know, that operates. And only when another law will supersede it. Now we have, uh, you may have um, laws on the books that get superseded by another law. In other words, you know, there's an amendment to the Constitution that supersedes something. So let's say it this way. Um, and, 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 and now this is a very hot button topic and, you know, we're not really trying to run off over there, but, um, abortion. Now you'll hear a lot of people go and argue, well, that's settled law. And, <clears throat> and it's, you know, you just can't pass a state law to overturn the federal law because it's settled. And however, if there is an amendment to the constitution that declares that abortion is illegal, it was superseded. Okay. And so when we have like the law, you know, the law of the Sabbath from the old Testament, well, the Supreme court of heaven over, um, you know, superseded that when Jesus came and said, have you not heard that David and his disciples, his, his men went into the house and took the showbread on the Sabbath day. Um, Jesus said that Matt Sabbath was made for man and not, you know, not man for the Sabbath. So he, he superseded that law. The law of, you know, of sacrifices was superseded. Hebrews, you go through the book of Hebrews and all the Levitical order, um, the sacrificial operations and all that were superseded by one great and final high priest. So although it was settled law, it was, it was superseded by a higher law. We are the new and the better covenant established on better promises. So <clears throat> only in the case of a, of a superseded law does settled law have to abdicate. Now, the thing is, when we look at the new and the better covenant established on better promises, uh, Hebrews 9, 8, I believe, um, could be wrong about that, but that's, you know, we, we can clarify that later. Um, then we, we look at it and we understand that the, that the superseding law of anything over the, in the old covenant that was superseded was new and better. Okay. So he's not Jehovah Rapha of the old and the sickness giver of the new. He's not the blesser of the old and the cursor of the new. Hallelujah. <clears throat> um, now, where law was not superseded, it thus remains in effect. Hallelujah. I said glory to God. So now we can, we can kind of take that back. Now, uh, I know we're under grace, that we may be under grace, but grace did not supersede living according to God's moral code. In other words, you don't get to go out, oh, I'm under grace. We get to go commit adultery because we're under grace and not under law. I mean, the law said, you know, settled law says adultery is wrong. Under the due, I'm under grace, so therefore it's superseded. Notice that you can't do that. Where it's not addressed and see the Old Testament. Now, God's moral code is still God's moral code. He didn't, Jesus did not come. What did he say? I didn't come to undo or to do away the law. I came to fulfill it and empower humanity to live according to God's moral code and God's design empowered by him because in the flesh they couldn't do it and have forgiveness and red restoration when they do miss it and sin but not so they could live there on purpose without any consequences just because now they're under grace. The, the, the superseding of grace did not supersede how God intended for us to live in the first place. Remember, the old law, the, test, the, the Levitical law was given as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. 
Hallelujah. What? To empower us to live above that, that state and that place. <coughs> to live in a whole new sphere altogether. Now, um, moving back out of that, I, don't, I really don't want to go down that road too far. But God's word is settled. It's settled law. Okay? Uh, look at Hebrews 4.12. So when the word of God says, by his stripes, ye were healed, that's settled law. Okay? Um, we need preachers telling us that God don't do that anymore to keep people sick. You know, you got, it's like um, the devil sends preachers as his trial case to um, combat settled law, to try to Chip White, now you got that going on now with like, well, like, let's just use abortion again. We've got states bringing case after case after case after case trying to chip away at RV Wade. And there has been some, you know, you know trying to chip away at, um, you know, when they could have an abortion. Um, I do believe now one state just passed that um, life begins at conception. And therefore, they're entitled to protection under the 14th Amendment. Okay, um, and you know these, these you know, and, and if that case were to go and win, it would supersede R. V. Wade. And if that went to the Supreme Court and was ruled, life begins at conception, and they 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 are therefore under protection. I believe it's the Fourteenth Amendment. Then they would, you know, the right to life and and and, and so forth. Um, they would then be protected, and all the abortion would have to stop. Okay. Hallelujah. <coughs> and I'm not, that's not, I'm not pre preaching. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to use that as an example of how God has settled things. The word of God, Jesus came and, and healed. Um, Peter says that by his stripes, we were healed. So we're all talking about something that the integrity of God's word, it being his word meaning it's not changeable only by a higher authority or a higher law instituted can it be overturned or changed and God's overturning is always for our better and not for our worse so he's not going to be the blesser the giver the covenant keeper of the old covenant and the smacker the you know um, home wrecker you know home destroyer of the new praise the Lord Hebrews 4.12 now, let's, let's go ahead, talks about that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder, or piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now what we're really after here is the word of God, for the word of God. God's own word declares that his word is, is the, is the word. Amen. First Peter one, or I'm sorry, second Peter one. Hallelujah. Verse uh, 19. I love this. Verses 19 through 21. <clears throat> Let's back up. Um, verse 16, verse 16. Peter writing, he says this, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which, we, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Stop. Look, look back up at your computer, your, your screen. Peter says they saw it. They saw the transformation, transfiguration. They heard the voice from heaven. He's making our, we, we don't follow 
cunningly devised fables. We saw him in his power and his glory. We heard the excellent voice of heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But listen to what he comes back with after making that statement. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do take heed is unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn um, and the day star arise in your heart. Stop. We have a more sure, wait, more sure than what? Than seeing Jesus transfigured and the Father speak out and hearing the Father speak out of heaven, this is my beloved Son. Wow. I mean, well, if I heard, if I saw that and heard that, I'd, you know, <clears throat> Peter said, we got something more sure than that. Well, what is it? Well, verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved of the Holy Ghost. Now, he says that the scripture is a more sure word of prophecy than seeing Jesus transfigured and actually hearing the audible voice of God. Amen. Now, I need a few amens to scroll on that screen right there. Maybe even some happy dancers. Hallelujah. Because that's the truth. You know, oh, if I could just, if I could have seen him in his glory, if I could have heard the voice of God, oh, well, I would believe. But Peter's saying you don't need that. We have the scripture. We have the scripture, which is a more sure word. Amen. Now, if God's word is God's word, as we've already stated, God's word declares that it's the word, his word, then we have to believe what the word says. Now, um, we have to believe what the word says and not what we think it says. Look at Joshua 1.8, or, or go to Joshua 1.8. Hallelujah. Uh, I am reminded so much. Uh, growing up, I grew up in church. Um, I grew up Pentecostal. And, um, you know, um, growing up Pentecostal, you know, we, you know, we hear, you hear things. People, people make statements. And you'll begin to believe that the, those statements are actually Bible. I mean, I mean, there, there, there are a couple of things I just thought were absolute hardcore written in the Bible scripture and that's just the way it was and I'll give them to you they are the Lord helps those who helps themselves hmm well it even sounds Bible don't it and then cleanliness is next to godliness wow man I'm going to be honest with you now, I grew up believing, if you ask me, I mean, if you would ask me <clears throat> that if that was in the Bible, I would say, yeah, it's in the Bible. Because oh, I'd heard, I'd heard it like quoted like um, John 3, 16. From pulpits, from the old saints, from grandma. I mean, you know, you just believe. Well, I remember when I, um, got saved. Now you got to understand when I got saved, I was radically crazy nut bag. I mean, off the rails saved. I embarrassed my girlfriend. She did happen to go ahead and marry me and stay with me. And, um, in a few weeks would be 40 years. And, um, she had her chance to run back then. And when she's in the room, uh, what, are, what are you thinking? Are you thinking maybe you should have? 
I didn't get a response. Sweetie? Um, nothing. She didn't respond. I'm messing on her. Hallelujah. Um, but I remember, you know, telling people, yeah, godly this is, you know, and they, they said, well, where is that? I said, I don't know. It's in the Bible somewhere. Well, I, I had, now this, this is a pretty big Bible right here. This is the, uh, this is the, this is the Hagen Legacy Edition. Hallelujah. It's, it's pretty, it's, it's a good size. But the Rumley Bible was about this much, this way, and this much tall. I mean, it was, it was a horse choker Bible. And um, I had that, and then I had a, a strong, I bought a strong exalted concordance. I didn't know where anything was in the Bible. I had to start finding out, and we didn't have PC software. Didn't even have PCs, I mean, back then. Uh, they can't, They were introduced about the time I got saved. But there wasn't anything like Bible software or anything like that back then. Um, and so, you, you know, you, if you wanted to find something, you got you a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. Now, that bad boy is about this big and about the A-wide and about that thick with every word in the Bible and the verse it's located. He went as far as to put, now, he didn't give out any verse references other than, you know, I mean, reference. He, you know, most of them he would put a little part of the verse like, you know, um, uh, love. He would say, you know, God so love, and then he would give the reference. <clears> On <throat> the V and the A and the S, he, I mean, he put every one of those out there and the actual references. So I remember <coughs> when I need, I need, because I told people that, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness, and the Lord helps us to help themselves. It was in the Bible, and they had been asked, where is it? I was, you know, well, you know by, not by Christians, because they all knew it was in the Bible. Are you here? But, you know, people you're talking to is sharing, I got saved, and, and they're talking, and I could talk for a mile a minute and, and for a month long uh, and, um, you know, just kept right on going. And um, I thought, well, I better find out where they are so I can show people, I can tell people exactly where they are. I spent three days in my spare time going through the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible for every word of those so-called scriptures. And you know what I found out? They weren't in the Bible. I searched and I searched and I searched because I, I knew they had to be in there. There's no way grandma had quoted that uh, chapter and verse without, you know, with such authority without it being in the Bible. And, um, after that time, I got a revelation. There's also a book of the Bible that even the Apocrypha doesn't contain, and it's called the Book of Opinions. Hello. And I found out that the Lord helps those who help themselves, and cleanliness is next to godliness, is in the Book of First Opinions. Never to quote it again. Hallelujah. And so we need to know what the Bible says and believe what the Bible says and not what we think it says. Thinking it says one thing doesn't produce faith. Hello? And doesn't produce results. Joshua 1 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate, mutter, uh, therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Hallelujah. It is important that we um, meditate in the word of God so that we can observe to do what it says. Not, listen, that we may observe to do according to all that's written therein. Not what we think is written therein. Hello. There are a lot of people who are based on how they live and what, based on what they think the Bible says and not what it says. And will put other people into captivity and bondage into what they think it says 
and not by what it says. Hello? We mean cat. If you're trying to get people to do something that you think the Bible says and the Bible don't say it, you're putting them into captivity. Because you're, you're getting them <coughs> um, caught up in your opinion. All right. So Acts 17. Now you can go to for, for, one thing you can do in your book of Acts is you can go to the beginning of the book of Acts, right there on that part where it says the Acts of the Apostles, and just I mean, um, and scratch through that. It's the Acts of the Holy Ghost through the early church. Amen. See, when we see Acts of the Apostles, we think they're the only ones who can do it. No. It's the Holy Ghost working through men and women of faith who yield themselves to his spirit. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 17, in verse 10, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, who were the Bereans, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, and of men, not a few. Notice, <coughs> they were open to hearing what was said, but they searched the scriptures to prove it out. They searched the scriptures to prove it out. I mean, you could have a preacher preaching, yeah, you just never know. This might be your day. Come on down. To, and I've actually heard those words. This just might be your day. <coughs> come on down here and, and receive, you know, it might be your day to, to come to Jesus. Well, see, that's not what the Bible says. Hello? What they're saying is, you never know this might be your day of salvation. But Hebrews chapter 10 says, today is the day of salvation. Not it might be your day. Today is the day. Hello? Today is the day. Glory to God. Thank God for it. Can you say amen? Today is the day of salvation. And we're grateful for that because the word of God says so. Amen. Hallelujah. So they were more noble. They didn't just take somebody's word for it. We tell people all the time, don't take my word for it. If I preach it, don't you take my word for it. You better go find out for yourself. You need to look it up for yourself. You need to prove it out for yourself. Wow. Wow. Because faith comes by, come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now, uh, God uses preaching. God uses teaching to point us in the right direction, to, to get that out there to us. But we still need to take the responsibility of searching it out ourselves so that we know that the scriptures say it. Because somebody can take, say something, and they can be wrong what they said. Their opinion about it could taint it at least enough in verbiage that it would mess you up. Like the preacher saying, you know, come on. He's trying to get people to come to Jesus. He wants people to come down and give their heart to the Lord. But by saying, you never know, this might be your day, you've put it out there that it might not be your day. And then there's no basis for faith. Why? Because faith begins where the will of God is known. If you don't know, you can't come in faith. So you have to preach what the word says. Today is the day of salvation. Don't harden your heart as it did in the provocation and it didn't enter into my rest. Today's the day. Hallelujah. And then go with me, if you will, to the eighth chapter of the book of John, the gospel of John.
looking down into the 32nd verse. We'll look at verse 31. Um, then Jesus said to the Jews that believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You've got to stay in the word. He said continue in the word. Stay in the word. Live in the word. Believe it. So the first place of understanding in our journey to the highest kind of faith is understanding and having a realization revelation of the integrity of God's word. Amen. The integrity of God's word. Secondly, let's move on from there. We need an understanding of our redemption in Christ. From of our redemption in Christ. You need to understand that. Don't believe you can fully have a full place of understanding uh, of or walking in the highest kind of faith without having an in, you know, having insight into your redemption in Christ. In other words, the price to pay by Jesus to redeem you. Amen. Salvation is simply more than throwing you a life a preserver over the side of the boat and with a rope tied to it and dragging you to your destination. Hello? You kind of get that picture? You know, you fall overboard, you're drowning. You know, the, you know, Jesus is your life, your life uh, preserver. He's your life ring. You throw it overboard. It's what kind of rope tied to it. And you put it over, you know, you kind of slide into the ring and hang on. And the, and the ship just keeps going and drags you at 20 knots to whatever port of call you're headed to. That's, there's more to being saved than simply not drowning. Salva salvation. Now we, we take the word saved and we, we, we're saved from a devil's hell. Well, there's, that's, that's part of it. You're not going to hell. But that word <coughs> goes into a further or deeper understanding and, and more implication than simply not going to hell. As a matter of fact, the, the Greek word saved doesn't even address, as it were, hell. Although it, it's there, it does. Salvation does address hell in the sense that it redeems you from destruction. <coughs> um, the word sozo in the Greek, in soterius, the noun, Salvation. So, Sozo is saved. Sartarius is the noun for salvation. Uh, you know, therefore having compatible meanings. Um, has has more to do with restoring fallen humanity into their rightful position with God than it does about not going to hell. Now, thank God, not going to hell is part of it. But because we we use the word saved and our comprehension of the word saved has been limited and all, I mean, and, and, and um, I don't want to say rightfully so, but it is so because of the way we have preached it sometimes, you know, Jesus saves us from, uh, from going to hell. Um, the people's mindset again becomes what they think the words means and says instead of what it really says. Okay. So um, Jesus's blood, is the basis of our victory. Jesus' blood is the basis of our victory. Look at Colossians chapter 1, if you will. Because salvation is really more about redemption, purchasing back, than it is about stopping a current destination, you know, or a change of, not just, it's not just a change of destination. Sorry, sir, we're no longer aboard. This plane's no longer going to um, San Francisco. It's going to Paris. You know, it's not just a change of destination. Okay. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse um, 12 states, Giving thanks unto the Father, which made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Now we now say that's hell going to hell. And translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Now notice it's delivered from the power of darkness, translated into his kingdom, redemption through his blood. Hallelujah. Forgiveness of sin. What does that accomplish? Well, forgiveness of sin gets you cleansed. Forgiveness of sin gets you where you can be, I love the word justify. We always like to make a little play on it. Just as if I'd never sinned. Hallelujah. So we can go stand before the Father uh, free from guilt and free from condemnation uh, through the precious blood of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So whom, whom we have redemption through his blood. So salvation is about redemption. Reestablishing fallen man to his rightful place in the scheme of God's plan, which is made in his image, after his likeness, after his kind, with authority to subdue and to reign over the earth. Glory to God as, king, as a kingdom of priests. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Listen to this. Now, I mean, you got. I guess we better jump back up to 17. Uh, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? And that's why he said, that's why we, starting out with what just didn't make any sense in Paul's rhetorical, you know, statement. Know ye not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and you have of God, and you are not your own. Listen to verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Hallelujah. Now, I will... Um, Say this to my brethren who, who, who major on grace to the point of error, not that grace is error, um, but when they when you leave it on the table that doing whatever you want to do doesn't matter what you do with your body you're you're under grace uh, you know no matter what I mean if people believe this and I know it because I've heard them I've heard them they've had them tell me I've had them tell me just flat out tell me yet Paul says here. You are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Hello. Amen. Why? Because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Redemption. Um, our place in God. Amen. So we need to understand our redemption in Christ. The cleansing by his blood. Um, Hebrews 9. Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse uh, 11. <clears throat> but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, hallelujah, you know, or this creation of this, this realm, it was, it was a higher realm, the heavenly realm, neither, By the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. For the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. How much more? 
shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Your redemption in Christ is a blood-bought redemption. Now, the term redemption means to purchase from. We've been purchased from Satan's authority by the blood of Jesus. Glory to God. I said glory to God. You know, I remember growing up, we used to have what they call s &H green stamps. Some of y'all, I know there's, there's folks out there who are old enough to remember s &H green stamps. And you had grocery store chains that um, when you went in and bought groceries and you bought a certain, you know, whatever dollar amount you did, you got a certain number of s &H green stamps with your purchase. You know, when I was, you spent $50, you may have got, I don't remember how many, but 30 and you had a little book at home, kind of like a stamp collector book, but it was an S.H. green stamp book. And you'd go home and stick your green stamps in it. Take, and they made just like little stamps. But they, were, they said S.H. and they were green on, around the edges. and um, Not necessarily pretty green, but they were green. And then you had a redemption catalog. And when you got enough S.H. green stamps, there were things all in that catalog you could redeem with. You could take it and order Oh, I don't know. I mean, all kinds of stuff. It's all kinds of gift items. Um, kind of like um, the old Wheel of Fortune. Back when you won money in Wheel of Fortune, you didn't get to take the money home. You know, you bought the furniture on the, on the set. Well, for $500, I want that couch or, you know. And, of course, it was way, way overpriced. $2,000, I get that, you know, put it together yourself recliner. Hallelujah. But... It was called redeeming the stamps. The stamps would purchase something. See, the blood of Jesus purchased us. We're bought with a price. So in order to have the highest kind of faith, we need to understand we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. We're to honor God in our body and in our spirit. They belong to him. They've been purchased by Jesus. By his blood. Glory to God. So having a reaction. So, you know, the first thing we see is having a, a understanding of the integrity of God's word. Secondly, is understanding our redemption in Christ. That we're purchased by him. Now, there's a song we used to, they used to sing. I, I've, uh, uh, outside of full gospel businessmen, they used to all stand out there as they're waiting for the doors to open up for the meeting or whatever. You know, um, I am his and he is mine. His banner over me is love. I am his and he is mine. His banner over me is love. Amen. Well, how do we come? How do we, we became his because he purchased us. He gave himself to us. He purchased us to himself. We are now his possession. And we're to live honorably before the Lord and honorably in how we conduct ourselves. It will hurt your faith if you don't. Now, I know there are people out there preaching stuff that they shouldn't be preaching because they're wrong. And it don't matter. It won't hurt your faith. It don't matter what you do with your body. You're under grace and trying to get you to have faith in grace. Well, thank God for grace. And I have faith in grace that when I do miss it, there is the cleansing work of Jesus going on in my life. But I am not going to go and go, well, it just don't matter what I do. I'm going to get blessed anyhow. You're hurting yourself. And you're hurting your faith. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not. Not if God condemn us not, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And we know we have the things we've asked of him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because our heart, our heart condemns us not. 
So how does that happen? When we understand where he is and he's ours and we're living our lives. And when we know we're wrong, we've done it wrong, we, we, we get that under the blood of Jesus so that our conscience is cleansed. See, repentance for the believer is more about cleansing of the conscience than he is getting God not to kick you out the front door. He's not going to kick you out the front door. And there's, so that's that side where people teach grace that they're right on, but they overemphasize it so much that they leave out the part that, you know, repentance on our part, godly sorrow, work of repentance. When we recognize we haven't glorified God in our body and we put that under the blood and get it straight, it's, it, it's a purging in our conscience. There's a cleansing in our conscience of that. So we can stand with confidence. Our heart doesn't condemn us. We can stand with purity before God. Hallelujah. And it's so simple. You don't, it doesn't take a, a month-long uh, effort of, of um, penance to get there. Glory to God. Now that leads us into the next point of which we will get to next week. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If I can figure out how to run this thing. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Um, you know, we're, um, our um, camera operator people are leaving to go. Can you go on a vacation? How dare they? Glory to God. So, but that, that leads us to the, the, uh, the, the segue into that third point. And that's going to go and tell you, give you the head, head title to it. Uh, the reality of the new creation. Or the new creature. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, we're glad y'all could join us tonight for our um, fireless side chat. There is a fireplace back behind me here. Hallelujah. Um, but you know, on on you know faith foundations and seven steps to the highest kind of faith. We're on, on two. We've done two, and uh, we'll move into some more next week. Okay. Uh, listen, we love you and uh, we appreciate you. I want you to remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next time here, Faith and Victory Church, online.